chapter 7 for some reason. No, chapter 7 would be zoology. Okay. It's really starting to eat on you, and it's yeah. combined the two. She was telling me the scriptures we get there and start talking about turtles. Probably will. You have two presentations, don't you? Effects of blood pressure of O2 on ventilation. They say a bunch of stuff in there, but pressure of O2 has no effect on ventilation. I don't care what they say. What does have an effect on ventilation? We work off negative feedback. We're not reading pressure of O2. We're reading pressure of CO2. CO2. That's exactly right. Uh, in, the, in the first sentence, it says it only affects it indirectly. Well, why do you even have a column with that in there? Okay, so move on to 550. Uh, SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. We could talk about this for quite a while. You still hear of this pretty often. Uh, I know we have two with babies in here. Uh, how's a doctor tell you to lay your baby in the crib at night? On their back, okay? You know, uh, I've been having babies for so many years, I've done every way possible. And they told us different, every, they've gone through belly, your mind the back, to side, back to belly, now we're back to back. We even had a deal with wedge them in on their side at one time. Now we never actually did that. I stayed old school, it made more sense to me. But, but uh, my kids are both dead. Why, why is the reason we don't put them on their belly now? Nose down into the into the sheets, breathing CO2, which would slow breathing and maybe stop the medulla for SIDS. What was the reason we put them on their on their belly to start with? So if they vomited, they didn't aspirate. Okay. So now we got them on their back. Forget the vomit, but we slow down SIDS. But think about it. These kids are so limber when they're relaxed at night. We can't turn our head straight this way, can we? They can, can't they? So if they vomit, it'll come out the side of their mouth. Chances of aspiration still quite a bit less. So I was so paranoid about it. Oh yeah. I heard this like they like in the they had in a little seat with the swing thing, so they sat up. Yeah, like in my face. My yeah. first one I slept with her like she was right there on my arm the whole time, and then my second one she yeah, sleeps with a blanket yeah. right there in her face. And it's actually not good for you to sleep with your kids. Yeah. Uh, for two reasons. They tend to want to snuggle with you, which is no different than throwing 15 stuffed bears in the crib with them. And they get to snuggle up there, and it's the same thing as suffocating them. And uh, me, I just roll over on and think, what's that lump on there? You know, and I never even knew. They come to my bed, and I said, go to your own bed. <laughs> so they never come to my bed. None of them come to my bed. They, if they come in there and want to stay, I can hear them over here. To mom, you know, and mom saying, "You better not get in this bed. You know how crabby daddy is. <laughs> you better get back in your own bed." Well, she uses me. She doesn't want me in there either. So. I wouldn't either. Get your own bed. You, I, yeah. I paid for that bed for you to sleep in. Now you're gonna sleep yeah, in. Yeah, that's exactly what I tell them. So, <laughs> there's your uh, idea on something sudden infant death syndrome. Ultimately. If it's going to happen for whatever tri clicks the trigger on the medulla and says stop breathing, there's probably not a whole lot that we can do. It's, it's, it's just going to happen from time to time. Now, we've done all we can to reduce those chances by, by not putting any, they don't even want bumper uh, deals around the cribs anymore because they get that in their face. So, I mean, nothing. They, no blankets, nothing. Just throw them in there and hope they don't freeze to death. That's, That's crazy. Thought, isn't they it? were like, Clothes, no blanket, nothing. Nothing. Oh, uh, can I? And they have clothes? How about a diaper? Can we put a diaper on them, you know, or we just need to put a bucket, a big pail underneath them? I don't know. I'm just glad my, I'm, I'm done having kids. I don't know if I get these raised or not, but I'm done having kids. I asked the wife the other day, I said, You ready for round three? And she looked at me like I was crazy. I looked at her in round two like she was crazy, but she won that battle. <laughs> Effects of pulmonary receptors on ventilation. Unmyelinated C receptors are sensory neurons in the lungs that can be stimulated by capsaicin. Let me tell you what happened here. I'm going to brief this up for you. What happened is somebody said, 
let's see how these respond to hot pepper spray. And so I'm gonna spray you some hot pepper spray down your throat or I'm gonna let you eat some hot pepper real fast. Do you know what their first response was to hot pepper in their throat? Coughing. Uh, no. What's your first response was if you eat something that's really hot and spicy? Oh my god, it's hot. <laughs> first response. That's your first response. And then all the secondary responses of <coughs> water, alcohol, whatever you get your hands on. Milk. <laughs> Milk. Table food, spoonfuls of sugar. They say sweetener helps slow down the burn. But So all they discovered here is that it'll make you gasp for air. So it hurts. Really hot stuff. That's all they figured out here. Your first initial response is apnea. You literally stop breathing for a minute or two. Y'all like hot stuff? Yes. Pe peppers are, I mean, they're part of the nightshade family. They're supposed to be good for you as far as building your immunity. At the same time, they encourage arthritis. If you already have arthritis, they tend to make your joints even stiffer. So dang if you do. You're, you're healthy, but you can't walk. Uh, you don't get, a, don't get a cold or flu, but you don't feel like getting out of bed. I love I just spicy. eat my jalapenos and keep creaking along. I just, I like the hot stuff. You can't walk along fast enough to catch a cold? No. <laughs> Not gonna chase anything down, that's for sure. <laughs> I raised this one pepper plant, and it looks like jalapeno plant. It don't get up very big, and it has little peppers on it. It looks just like jalapenos. I mean, just like it. And uh, I just happened to run across them somewhere else. I gotta have some of these. And the name of the plant is Fulia. It's a jalapeno plant that's genetically had the, the hot taken out of it. And they're really crisp. I mean, they're really a good taste in a little pepper. So I didn't tell anybody I planted them. So I've got these jalapeno plants in the garden, right? But they're not. So I grab a couple of them off the plant and I'm walking across the yard one afternoon, the wife and the kids out there doing something and I'm eating this raw jalapeno. And the wife looks at me and says, Several days later, I told them what it was. But I'll ask people, you like jalapenos? Oh, no, those are too hot. Oh, these aren't that bad, and I'll just eat one in front of them. How can you do that? Well, it's not hot. Now, a straight jalapeno like that, it'll light me up, but I like my jalapenos. I cook with them all the time. Everything I cook, I throw two or three jalapenos in there. I ought to be part Mexican, is not Maybe I am. All right, moving on here, uh, hemoglobin and oxygen transport. Yes, it does carry it. <laughs> on 552, we, there's, there's some terms here. You like the new teaching method, Josh? <laughs> yes and no. Yeah. The term deoxy, deoxyhemoglobin means the hemoglobin don't have any on it. The uh, term oxyhemoglobin means it does have it on there. And the term carboxyhemoglobin means it has carbon monoxide on the hemoglobin. Is it on right? All right, cool. The one th thing we really should note here is that your uh, red blood cells like carbon monoxide much greater than even oxygen. So your red blood cells has a greater affinity for carbon monoxide than it does even oxygen. So carboxyhemoglobin, carbon monoxide. Deoxyhemoglobin, not near as enough oxygen, lacking. Oxyhemoglobin, lots of oxygen. Hemoglobin concentration. You think anemia would have anything to do with oxygen carrying capacity? Obviously it would, like the red blood cells. There's a couple different kinds of anemia here uh, that uh, I believe they talked about in a, in a fitness application somewhere, but I don't see it right here. But, uh, anemia is below normal hemoglobin concentration of some kind or another. Uh, when hemoglobin concentration is above normal, it's polycythemia. I seldom do you get that. You'll see more anemia than polycythemia, but the oxygen carrying capacity of blood is increased accordingly. Now here's where a high altitude can play a role. We've talked about exercise quite a bit and working out in high altitude. That's where you would actually cause a polycythemia, uh, increasing more and above what would be considered the norm. Loading and unloading. We're just going to worry about unloading. And that means loading will be right the opposite. Okay? 
Unloading is what we're concerned about because we want to unload and make oxygen available. Unload. What one thing that's going to help unload would be increase temperature. As you increase body temperature, it's going to unload more oxygen and make it available. Number two, uh, acidic pH. Acidic pH is probably caused by increase of CO2 in the bloodstream, which is probably caused by exercise or some type of activity. That's going to cause more to be dumped. Number three, an increase amount of a substance called 2,3-DPG, a chemical produced by the body. That when oxygen levels are low, this chemical kicks in and causes more oxygen to be used. When we have venous return of blood somewhere in the neighborhood of 9%, when these three processes kick in, it'll, it'll use three or four more percent oxygen. It'll, it'll dump that much more and make it available. I'll get back over here, Jennifer, so you don't have to twist it around. All right. Uh, Uh, 554 is just telling us effects of pH and temperature on oxygen transport. And they, use, they use the Bohr effect to talk about it, but increased temperature dumps oxygen, PA, uh, acidic pH dumps oxygen, so they're working together on that. On uh, 555 is where they talk about the 2,3-DPG. This is an enzyme. Uh, the enzyme that produces 2,3-DPG is inhibited by oxyhemoglobin, is what they're saying. And what ultimately, if we have plenty of oxygen available, we're not demanding more oxygen, we don't need any 2,3-DPG. If you move from Oklahoma to Denver, Colorado, the first thing your body's going to do is start producing 2,3-DPG. The secondary aspect is make more red blood cells. Okay? The acidity will come into play during exercise in that process. If you're trying to exercise and you're still not getting enough oxygen, then acidity is going to cause you to be more efficient with what you have. That's what it's doing. These two makes you more efficient with what you have. This one makes you more efficient with what you have, but moving to a high altitude, time will make you have more to be efficient with, more red blood cells. So, Moving on over to 556, a little bit of fetal hemoglobin here. Normal adult hemoglobin in the mother has, uh, is able to bind to 2,3-DPG. Fetal hemoglobin, or hemoglobin F, has a greater affinity for oxygen than does adult hemoglobin. And, and that would make sense. Think about it. Does a child need oxygen through the placenta? Yeah, sure it does. So there, the child's hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, must have a greater affinity so mom's oxygen does jump across and help the baby out. Would that explain some tiredness during pregnancy? It would, wouldn't it? The baby's sucking glucose, he's sucking the oxygen. I mean, ultimately, we could call it a small parasite. Well, it grows up to be nice. big parasites. <laughs> <laughs> they start as an internal parasite, and they end up as an external parasite. So, but at the same time, they're a living parasite, and, and this is how the body takes care of them. Uh, and it's illegal to kill living parasites at whatever stage. In some states. <laughs> in my opinion, it should be illegal to kill them at any state. Uh, in any state and at any state. You know what I'm saying? Now, inherited defects of hemoglobin. Sickle cell anemia is one that 8 to 11 percent of African Americans have, and that's a really odd shaped red blood cell that does not carry oxygen well at all. In fact, it's. Uh, it's painful. The only good news with a person with sickle cell anemia is that they'll never get malaria. Malaria has to live in a normal red blood cell. So uh, the bad news is they're probably going to die sooner. If they have normal blood and live in a country with malaria, they're probably going to die sooner anyway. <laughs> That's a dang if you do and dang if you don't, isn't it? Now, 
Uh, let's move on down to thalassemia. Is uh, any of the family hemoglobin diseases found predominantly among people of Mediterranean ancestry? You have a couple different thalassemias here, but basically what it is is one of the compensations for thalassemia is increased synthesis of gamma chains. When they increase gamma chains, you have alpha, beta, gamma uh, processes in this, and this causes retention of large amounts of hemoglobin F. So then you have a fetal hemoglobin in an adult that doesn't turn loose oxygen very well. So your body's needing to use it, but it just holds on to the bloodstream and circulates around and your organs aren't getting sufficient oxygen, therefore they're gonna shut down faster in life. So this is gonna shorten your lifespan as well. So thalassemia is when adults have fetal hemoglobin. So there's two or three combinations there that's not uh, necessarily a good scenario. Now muscle myoglobin we mentioned in the cardiac chapter, we have it in the heart because it has a great affinity for oxygen. So when blood flows through, even in your skeletal muscle, number one means of venous return is skeletal muscle, right? So even when skeletal muscle contracts, it may push all the blood out of it. And if it does that, how's it gonna get oxygen? It has it stored out in the skeletal muscle with myoglobin. So that's one that has it. 558. Uh, carbon dioxide transport. Number one means of carbon dioxide transport is in the form of bicarbonate. It's in the form of bicarbonate. Number two, dissolved in plasma. Now they may not put them in that particular order, but that's the order in which most is carried. Uh, they have number one, dissolved in carbon dioxide, dissolved carbon dioxide in plasma. They have number two as carried on the hemoglobin, and then third, which is most common and the most abundant, is in the form of bicarbonate. So there's their ideas. Acid-base balance, moving on over to 560. We're using the principles of acid uh, pH and uh, the equation CO2 plus H2O gives us carbonic acid, which ends up yielding into bicarbonate and hydrogen, and that's a reversible reaction. And we're looking at the four things here. We're looking at metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis. We're looking at respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. That's what we're looking at. Now, the respiratory is pretty easy to understand. And on the respiratory end, uh, it's fixed by increasing or decreased breathing. If we have respiratory acidosis, acidosis is an increase of CO2 in the system. How do we fix that? Breathing a lot. And breathing getting, more. And we would out. hyperventilate. We would increase breathing to blow off more CO2. So if we have respiratory alkalosis, which is not enough CO2, we would breathe less. We would hypoventilate. So those are pretty easy fixes. Now breathing actually does help the metabolic end of it, but it's kind of a secondary effect, uh, not a direct, but in a kind of an indirect effect. Now they look at, at metabolic acidosis can result from excessive production of non-volatile acids. For example, it can result from excessive production of ketone bodies and uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. Now, there's definitely acidosis problems in diabetics. They have to DK. maintain, oh, they have to watch it close. Now, when they say non-volatile acids, that's fatty acids, lactic acids, ketone bodies, and that kind of thing. And that's acidosis. The uh, uh, bicarbonate, well, let's see where I'm at down here. Bicarbonate to buffer the non-volatile acids helps uh, in this equation, as you look at that equation. Uh, this occurs, uh, well, let's look at this other two examples they give here. Think about this. If, uh, if a person has uh, a stomach virus and has severe vomiting, would this cause Metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, if it's so severe we can't hold anything down. Alkalosis? It would cause metabolic alkalosis. And why? Because you're vomiting stomach acid. And so what's left? Well, the alkaline secretions of the small intestine and beyond is what's left. And so it causes metabolic alkalosis. And on the other hand, you have another stomach virus, but instead of vomiting, we have severe diarrhea to the uncontrolled status, causing metabolic acidosis, right? 
because we're losing all the alkaline secretions from small intestine down, but we're maintaining the acids in the stomach. So ultimately, if you put just general knowledge theory to this, uh, the two bucket flu, you'd just simply be neutralized, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's an awful thing to think about, isn't it? You've been there, and you're on. Oh yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, that's not a good scenario. We, we may be trying to neutralize one side with the other, but dehydration will set in quickly in that case. So we'd have to hook you up to an IV and pump some fluids in you. We can do that right here in the lab. We'll just hook you up to a water hose and fix you right up. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, you can see where the metabolic end comes in play. Uh, and indirectly, with uh, alkalosis and, and acidosis, whether it's metabolic or respiratory, uh, it can be ultimately helped some by breathing. They, uh, they help some rise it up pretty good on 561. Respiratory acidosis or alkalosis occurs when car carbon dioxide concentrations are abnormal. Metabolic acidosis and alkalosis occurs when bicarbonate concentrations are abnormal. So it just depends on which part of the equation you're looking at. If you look back at the equation, carbon dioxide is a respiratory problem at the beginning. Bicarbonate is a metabolic problem at the end. Now, being a reversible reaction, if CO2 is carried in the form of bicarbonate, it will eventually make it back to the lungs, where it turns back into CO2 and H2O. Therefore, as an indirect correction, breathing can even help the metabolic end of it. We need to stop the diarrhea and vomiting, though, at some point. <laughs> that's a, uh, uh, that's, those are just horrible. And you feel so much better after you vomit, and then you feel it coming on again. It's awful. Curly, you ever been there? Yeah, it's I get awful. migraines. Oh, migraines will make... That'll cause the vomiting, won't it? Yeah. yeah. Not a good scenario. Ventilation and acid-base balance. I think we pretty much covered this. Now, uh, increased carbon dioxide, we have too much. Acidosis, we're gonna hyperventilate. Not enough, we're gonna hypoventilate. Uh, the uh, other component that they mentioned in here would be uh, the kidneys help remove hydrogen. And there's an aspect of, uh, I'm not sure if it's in this chapter or not, there's an aspect at which the kidneys are trying to maintain hydrogen levels and uh, at the same time potassium levels. And I think I went across this scenario with you earlier that it can't seem to do both at the identical same time. So it tries to deal with the hydrogen and gets rid of some of that and potassium's building, runs over here and gets rid of potassium. And so acidosis could cause hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia could cause acidosis, but the kidney is really good at getting just enough done to prevent all of it. Just running back and forth and taking care of it's pretty cool. 562. Uh, the last thing it mentions at the top of 562 couple last things here. A person with metabolic acidosis will hyperventilate. This is because the aortic and carotid bodies are stimulated by an increase of blood hydrogen. Okay, so we're trying to indirectly fix blood hydrogen by hyperventilating, which is really not fixing it because what has to get rid of the hydrogen? Kidneys. Okay, but we're seeing it and it sends a message to where? The medulla. So as a result of hyperventilation, a secondary respiratory alkalosis is produced. This person is still acidotic, but not as much so as would be the case without compensation. People with partially compensated metabolic acidosis would thus have a low pH and would be accompanied by a low pressure of CO2 because we breathed off a whole lot, trying to take care of it on the front end and preventing the buildup of more. You're not getting rid of the hydrogen that's already there, you're getting rid of more CO2 to prevent that pH from getting worse from where it's at. That's why this is, that's how this is playing. 
So metabolic alkalosis is partially compensated for by the retention of carbonic acid due to hypoventilation. So we retain a neutralization aspect, if you will. Ventilation during exercise, this is somewhat repetitive. Obviously, it's going to be a delayed reaction. Increased ventilation as the body sees you doing a lot more uh, exercise and needing more oxygen, ventilation is going to gradually increase. Even maybe to the point of, uh, of uh, almost doubling. Yeah, I mean, it could. The, it's going to read off pressure of CO2, obviously. Now, lactate threshold endurance training. A trained athlete can last longer without increased respiratory rate because he can work longer off an anaerobic state. The muscles learn to store more. So they store more. Technically, we call it anaerobic state because we're, we're uh, not breathing heavily, but the muscles have become more efficient and being ready for this because you've done more of it that we don't have to go into this massive breathing rate like I would if I walked upstairs one time. More you breathe in hard time we get to the top of the stairs, Jed. That's not a good sign. <laughs> yeah, there was a day I could run up and down those stairs and never breathe hard, but that day is gone. And not to come back, probably. Continued heavy exercise can cause a person to reach a lactate threshold, which is maximum rate of oxygen consumption that can be attained before blood lactic acid levels rise as a result of anaerobic metabolism. At some point, breathing rate will kick in and start supplying more oxygen. Lactate thresholds always higher in endurance trained athletes. These athletes, uh, because of higher cardiac output, have a higher rate of oxygen delivery to the muscles. And uh, the muscles, whether it be cardiac or skeletal, has got more stored. It's got more myoglobin in it. As you build those muscles, it builds mitochondria and myoglobin. It stores more. They're just better prepared. You can't just go cold turkey into something and expect everything to work. You train for it. You tell your body what to expect, and then the body prepares for what to expect. You can't lay out a baseball for two years and expect to go out there and throw it 90, can you? You might throw it one time 90, and then your arm's toast, because <laughs> it's not a good scenario. All right, acclimatization to high altitude. We've uh, covered quite a bit of that already. I think we can uh, identify high altitude. The first thing we're going to do to acclimate to it will be probably increase 2,3 dpg. So what, what uh, oxygen we have, we can dump it and use it. We become more efficient with that. Over time, we're going to increase red blood cell production, so we'll have a greater carrying capacity still utilizing this. But if we go into an exercise mode or whatever, then these two will help us become more efficient as well. That's how you acclimate, acclimate to high altitude. How long would it take if you're up at high altitude and you come down to here? Would it take for your red blood cell count to reduce back to normal? Well, that's a good question. Uh, having a 120 day lifespan, it would be obviously gradual. As some died off, they wouldn't be replaced uh, because of an unnecessary uh, aspect of it. But um, just to put a number to it, two weeks, three weeks, I don't think we can uh, because of the 120 day lifespan. That, you can almost take the first day you go to that and count that as day one if your body start building more red blood cells. And then the day you come back is day one you come back and you can estimate out there how many red blood cells, you know, it's just. If you're exercising on a regular basis, wouldn't your red blood cell count live less than 120 days? passing through the capillaries more often? No, not necessarily. Just, just because we use them harder doesn't mean their lifespan is reduced. Um, I don't know that red blood cells uh, wear out faster uh, with use. I mean, they're, they function for what they do. I mean, obvious, to me, it's obvious that the body, the more you exercise, the more it uh, is able to replenish, regenerate, uh, more oxygen available. So it's just, it's a livelier, livelier body than one that uh, is a couch potato aspect. But, 
Uh, there's, I saw a deal last night of the uh, the cons of too much exercise. The uh, I didn't get to see the whole thing, but I told my wife, I said, I told you you're exercising too much. That's why I don't exercise that much. And she said, oh, good grief. They're talking about triathlon athletes and people that just overkill themselves that do 20 miles a day or this crazy stuff like that, you know. Now, they're not talking about uh, 30 minutes of low impact aerobics <laughs> where you've got your thumb going with this and one leg kicking over here. That, that, I don't think that's what they're talking about. But I used it to that aspect. Anyway, uh, be very hard to put your finger on the time frame there, but definitely will play a role in that. Um, I didn't tell you all about the ghost deer, did I? This is actually a true story. Josh starts laughing, thinks I'm coming up with something new. This is actually a true story. I read an article, and it was actually in a hunting magazine, but it was more of a, to me, I read it as a medical article. As a, a doctor wrote the article, he and two of his friends was going to uh, Himalayas, I believe it was, to hunt what was called a ghost deer. And uh, the reason it's called a ghost deer is not only at the top of the Himalayas, but even if you're up there, very few people sees it, but it does exist. The natives hunt it and was eat it. The natives live about halfway up. And say the natives, the people, the colony, the community that lives there that thinks they own that mountain from that point up, <coughs> live there. And so this doctor had made contact with them and, and uh, the kids loved to play soccer, so they bought their way to the top of the mountain by the doctor bought all the kids' soccer suits and, and uh, they, they sent a guide to them to take them up to hunt the ghost deer. They had trained for months ahead of time. The doctor gave himself and everybody else complete and full physicals to the extent I think we can do this. Altitude up there, I don't really remember what it was, but the doctor was documenting daily basis uh, of how he felt their health was holding out. And on the seventh day up there, <clears throat> they had not seen nor killed a ghost deer. I guess that's why he's a ghost deer, huh? On the seventh day up there, he documented in his notepad, this will be our last day. I feel our health is being threatened. And so they hunted that morning and one of them killed a ghost deer. Sure enough. They got off. <laughs> Nobody's ever seen the deer, but they say they kill one. <laughs> it's worse, don't it? And so they, they come home, they get back to the States, and I think it was either two or three weeks after they got back to the States, one of the doctor's buddies that went on that trip died of a massive heart attack. Massive heart just killed him. Bam. Now why? Nope. Lack they didn't of oxygen. down that fast. <laughs> Lack of oxygen? The blood was too viscous. Oh, and it put it imposed such a workload on the heart, the heart couldn't do it anymore. Now, two or three weeks, surely some of those red blood cells had killed off, right? Not not replaced like you was asking about, but not enough, obviously. They their blood had gotten so thin, that's what the doctor knew. That's the reason he noted it. He said he said our, our lives feel threatened, or I feel our lives are threatened. It is difficult to breathe. That was his other sentence. Difficult to breathe means this blood's not moving very fast. Can you imagine this mud-like blood trying to get through the capillaries of the lungs and pick up oxygen? I mean, it, that's how thin, that's what they call it, the, the air is that high. Now, I wish I remembered what the altitude was. I, I want to say 15 to 20,000. I mean, that's, I, I've been 14. And I wouldn't want to stay there very long because it just, we went to 9,000 and hung out at 9,000 for a couple of hours to kind of start acclimating. And then we went on to 14, 14 something. And uh, uh, one of the ladies in the trip, she just, she immediately went downstairs and they put her on auction mask. She didn't, she didn't handle it well at all. And uh, you didn't want to do a whole lot because you'd get lightheaded, I'm telling you, you just kind of ease along you still kind of felt a little funny. But people working that all the time, they're, they get used to it. But at the same time, that's got to be hard on the heart, don't you think? Working in that kind of altitude all the time. I don't even, 
Mr. Holt or Mr. Hughes could probably tell you the name of the mountain. Is it was one of the mountains in Hawaii, and the largest telescope in uh, I mean, it's the largest telescope in the world sitting there. We we got our eyes and our hands on it right there. They were actually cleaning it. They were tearing it down and cleaning it, and it's pretty. It was pretty cool. But I didn't want to step there very long. I, whew, that was that was just it's kind of like. A, How you feeling? I feel great. Oh well. All right, uh, affinity for uh, hemoglobin for oxygen. It's good, but not as good as carbon monoxide. Put it that way. Uh, 2,3-DPG is going to decrease the affinity, obviously, uh, because it's going to make things more available as the pH increased temperatures are all going to decrease that affinity for oxygen. Increase hemoglobin and red blood cell production. I think we've covered that. We've got that covered. We're going to increase that because the oxygen content by the kidney sees lack of oxygen, produces erythropoietin, goes to the red bone marrow, sells red bone marrow. We need more red blood cells, more oxygen carrying capacity. So that's what happens. And I finally finished it. I got done with the chapter. Isn't that wonderful? Now, chapter 17 kidney physiology. I've got to get in every minute I can. In kidney physiology, the uh, the kidneys. Wait, you said chapter. This is chapter 17. The kidneys see more blood than any other organ. Now I'm not saying it necessarily utilizes more blood, but it sees it. There's there's a lot of regulation that goes on in the kidneys. I'll give you some general ideas here, and then and then uh, probably tomorrow in the lab I'll finish this chapter up. Uh, by putting a bunch of stuff on the board. You have some handouts, so be, be sure and bring your book and handouts and stuff for that because uh, we're going to need to utilize those. But the kidney sees about 45 to 50 gallons, 180 liters of blood a day. You only have five and a half liters in your blood flow system, so it's seeing that same blood over and over and over. It actually filters 125 milliliters per minute. Uh, how many milliliters in that bottle of water right there? Okay, so a fifth of that bottle is filtered every minute by the kidney. How much of that 125 milliliters actually turns into urine or waste per minute? Not much. Typically, I'll have somebody say, well, half of them, and that's fine. I, I need those kind of answers for, the, for this purpose. Uh, one to two milliliters per minute will turn into urine. And if half of that turned into urine, uh, you'd probably be the next headliner in the paper. Uh, Jed peed himself to death. <laughs> That'd be bad if somebody urinated themselves to death because that's a, that's a lot of fluid leaving the body. I mean, you'd literally be drinking it in and going out the other end. That'd be a loose end in that water hose somewhere. But uh, that's that's what the kidney does. Now, we can concentrate about 4.2 times that of blood osmotic concentration. So if we're a little dehydrated, we can hold back some waste to maintain blood volume and concentrate urine even more. Um, other animals have a greater ability. A camel would, living in the desert, it can concentrate urine eight times that. You think, well, that's pretty good, but it's not great. A gerbil can concentrate urine 14 times that. And then my favorite is the Australian hopping mouse. <laughs> can concentrate urine 25 times that of normal osmotic concentration. And what, what, in <coughs> essence, what that's saying is that just a little drop of that Australian hopping mouse's urine you're going to smell it for a long ways. That's, no, that's solid waste. But this little animal, <coughs> unlike ourselves, if we get thirsty, we've got water in front of us, or we can go down the hall, we've got water available. This little animal lives in an environment that there is not no pool of water for this animal to drink out of. And this animal totally, well, you got something pretty tough in that bottle there, didn't you? Oh, I just went down the wrong tube. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. That's what Jim said, going down the wrong tube, wasn't it? <laughs> this animal literally gets 10% of its moisture as free moisture in the food it eats, 
And the other 90% of its moisture that it consumes is through metabolic moisture, breaking down the food it eats. So it doesn't get thirsty to drink something. But water's not going down his wrong tube. It's food that's going down his. So that's why animals have that capability. So they list kidneys regulate volume of plasma, concentration of waste, concentration of electrolytes, and plasma pH. So basically the kidneys will get rid of anything in excess. Just keep that in mind. Anything in excess, it'll get rid of it. That's why a urine analysis is so good for drug tests. Seldom can you get by without it coming out in the urine because the body typically don't need that extra stuff, whatever, whatever the steroids or whatever it is, or the kidneys are gonna try to get rid of it. So kick it out the urine. Uh, Urine tests are a great way for pregnancy tests because the body just bombards those hormones in that system so the leftovers flow out the urine. So pregnancy tests, it's, we can find out a lot of things about somebody by doing a urinalysis. Probably things you don't want us to know. <laughs> All right, uh, we're gonna go over the far as the anatomy. We'll, we'll cover that in the lab. Another term for urination is micturition. Keep that in mind and that's on 576. We know the nephron is the functional unit. We're going to break the nephron down in the lab tomorrow. Each one of our kidneys has a million nephrons. Okay, a million nephrons. We need 25% of those to function for your kidney to do its job. If a kidney has less than 25% of its nephrons filtering, then that kidney's probably not keeping up with its job. Now, do we lose nephrons over our lifespan? Absolutely. We do all kinds of stuff to, to kill them off ourselves. Ibuprofen in excess will kill a nephron. But at the same time, some of them just die of old age. It's not the thing we're going to do about it anyway. Uh, a lot of the anatomy is on the next few pages, 579. We get into glomerular or ultrafiltrate. We're going to break that down on the board in the lab tomorrow. On page 582 is where they tell you about, in, in females it's 115 milliliters per minute, in males it's 125 milliliters per minute, and only about one to two of that is uh, actually gonna turn into urine. I will say we have an obligated water loss on a daily basis though. We are obligated to excrete at least 400 milligrams, or 400 milligrams, 400 milliliters of water a day just to get rid of the waste that our body's gonna build. So we're supposed to drink eight eight ounce glasses of water a day, and that's a minimum. You drink probably three or four of those bottles a minimum, but we're only obligated to pee out 400, 400 milliliters. Uh, auto regulation we'll talk about tomorrow. Reabsorption we're gonna talk about tomorrow. Counter current multiplying system we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, there's auditory water loss on 591. There's uh, ADH, and uh, guess what else is in this chapter? Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Sure, I'm glad Ron's going to do a good job on that because I'm not sure Charlie's sure going to show up. All right, we'll start up there. Tomorrow in lab, we'll knock this chapter out and get started in the other. Yes. Wednesday, we'll finish the other one review. We're going to have a test Friday.